example. For over a million and a half years, until just a couple hundred years ago, the hand axe was the main tool of humanity for a million and a half years. And the thing about a hand axe is only one guy can make it. Two guys making it, it's a mess. It, only one guy could make this. But the computer mouse, which became a symbol of our times and has made, you know, designed the world we live in, um, did you know that there's not one person on earth that can make one of these? <clears throat> not one person on earth can make this, if you think about it. You have to discover oil, drill oil, invent plastics, molds, factories. Not even the presidents of these companies, no one can make one of these. It takes millions of people to make one of these. Interesting, isn't it? That's collective intelligence. But it goes on. A mouse is old hat now. But think about it, replacing the hand tool. It did. And the mouse has only been around since the 80s, right? And it's already old. It's an old tool. And it takes, makes millions of people to make this, but the next tool, think about this, the evolution that's happening so fast right now. The next tool, look what we can do with our finger. One of us can do things like this. We can do things uh, with one finger. We can design satellites. We can see to the beginning of time. We can discover atoms. We can explore our minds with one finger now. What collective intelligence is brought to each and every one of us? Because there's not one of us that can build a tablet. Not one of us can do that. It takes millions of us to do this, but then when we get that empowerment, it becomes amazing. The empowerment that we're at today is stunning when you think about it. It just, just gets me. It's stunning. And where are we going from here? We're down to one finger and we can change the world. <laughs> the new paradigm, things getting easier. Interesting, isn't it? So another little thing to think about about collective intelligence is that really um, up until the end of the 1800s and into the 1920s, many people could not afford lighting. Candles were very expensive to own and only lasted an evening. And so your labor, to, this much of labor would take to buy one candle that would last one night. As collective intelligence and inventions and systems came on board, kerosene lamps, only 15 minutes of your time for a lamp that would burn for days. You see what I mean? And as time moved on, eight seconds of your labor to have a light bulb that lasts for, who knows, years. And now, 0 .5, 0 0.5 seconds for a bulb that could last 20 years. And it goes on to LEDs now and everything. LEDs will last 20 years and generate no heat. So imagine this collective intelligence, what it's coming. This is the real pattern that's going on out there. We aren't going back to the candles, and we shouldn't let anybody drag us back there either. We have to guard that. So think about that, how this is built up so rapidly. And the other thing is people worried about food on the planet. There's more food than we can use right now, but it's pretty much primitive the way we do it. In the... Um, 1950s, uh, production increased. And production isn't so much fertilizers, it's logistics, tractors, trucks, train lines. Logi people forget, they think it's all fertilizer? No. Um, quite a bit of the world still doesn't use fertilizer, but logistics are, are greater than they've ever been on planet Earth. And then by the year 2000, we, we, have, we actually farm, the amount of land we farm on planet Earth is about as big as Russia and Mongolia put together, if you add up all the farms on Earth. But farming is hard on the environment, it's risky, it's up to, uh, you know, it's up to weather and floods and all of that. And, that uh, uh, and, and what's happening, if yields continue to double as they have been, the pattern is to double, uh, we will be farming an area the size of three quarters of uh, Australia very soon. But get ready for a paradigm shift. Did you know that we already have the technology right now to feed all of America with a greenhouse the size of Manhattan? Organic, perfect food. Get ready for a paradigm shift. Here's how it goes. I'm a sky farmer. I'm involved in the sky farm movement. These buildings, all these buildings in cities, all generating food, each one climate controlled, exotic fruits, whatever you want. Hydroponics where you just spray the roots, very little water used. Organic everything. The only product is mulch and oxygen. Think about that. Get involved in it. Look up sky farming. I'm, I started a group <coughs> and I plan, to, I plan to be one. That's what I want to be as a sky farmer. How many empty buildings do you see in our cities? They overbuilt, didn't they? 
And uh, in San Jose, near where I live, I've gotten people very interested because there's lots of empty buildings. And you just empty them and bring in this, uh, this uh, automated hydroponics. And you, you create more jobs. Food is local. Cuts down on gasoline and trucking. And, you know, always in every transition, people lose their jobs and have to create new skills. The blacksmith did. The truckers will. The, all these intensive things um, are now almost unnecessary to do. Imagine if every city really got into this, and they can. These are, these are real systems that are going on, by the way. And it's very low impact, it takes very little water, and each, each floor of this could be climate controlled, whatever you want, delivered locally. In fact, many, many, uh, many, many efforts for rooftop farming and window uh, box farming in big cities is generating more food than the people in the building can eat. Yeah, you know, and this is the ultimate of vertical farming. So we could take all these empty buildings that are not of use to anybody now and turn them into farms create jobs and have healthy, healthier food than ever before. All over the world and all over America. That's a paradigm shift, isn't it? Who plants in the dirt anymore? It's so intensive and all the machines and all the fuel and everything it takes is over, you know? Um, I, I plan to be a big part of this. I, I really love this idea. Collective intelligence has made the most important contributions to our survival and to our transcendence to higher consciousness. Think about that. Collective intelligence is what's bringing us into higher consciousness. For most of us, uh, we are well on our way to higher consciousness because of all of us working together. The millions of people it takes to make a mouse, the millions of people it takes to get food to your table, make your glasses, make your clothes. Could you make all your clothes? Could you make your shoes? Could you make your cup? You see what I mean? Think, we're all working for each other. That's what this is really about. Economics is a distorted thing in the middle of it, and economics is changing and will change, but we're all working for each other and we're cooperating like never before on planet Earth. High degree of cooperation. So one other thing I want us to look at, there's, a, there's something that we're all missing from the Gaia perspective that's very important to understand. I used to believe that humans were going to overpopulate, overgraze, and destroy the earth. And after my experience, I, I was shown that it's impossible. And I have hard evidence for you. And something you aren't looking at is something that is traceable. Look it up yourself if you want to. The experts know about this. And the top companies with their supercomputers know about this already. And they're planning for it. And it's this. The most important paradigm shift that will change the whole world is happening right now. It's the most important, and it's called demographics. Demographics. Most spiritual people I talk to don't even know what the word means. Demographics. The world population and fertility rate is going down and down and down and down all over the world in every country. Many countries have hit zero population growth. That's because from the Gaia point of view, you only need so many brains, so many eyes, to go to the next level. It isn't, the old paradigm used to be about just get as much out there and hope some of them get through. <laughs> now it's pretty sure most of us. It's, many people think that there's a 95% chance that all this is going to go to ruin. But I have to tell you, and the people that really understand this, know that it's a 95% chance we're really going to succeed. That's a great, great odds. And it deals primarily, and especially if you believe humans are the problem on planet Earth, it, believe, it directs, di connects directly to demographics all over the planet, all over the planet. The world population, uh, the baby boomers um, have peaked. The average age worldwide is in their 50s. Uh, somebody's retiring every 10 seconds now. Um, and we really started dipping uh, really about 75 or so, because if you look at true demographics, you don't look at the entire count of the population, because you have young people, you don't know how many of those are going to live. You have the elder people, you don't know how soon they're going to die. You look at the median age population. You look at that wave going through time, you see? So when someone tells you there's 7 billion people on planet Earth, yeah, but how many, uh, most of them now are over 50. And it's sobering to start thinking about your legacy work. Where will most of us be in 50 years? The world population, without <laughs> world population, 
is going to dip dramatically starting around 2020. So my important dates are 2020, 2060, and 2100. Um, you're going to have, I don't know if you've noticed already, but we're going to start noticing our friends passing on, people we know passing on, more and more so now. Um, it's, it's happening. And the world population without aliens, invasions, comets hitting the planet, or conspiracies is going down now and may end up somewhere around 2100 at, I, uh, the light has told me, somewhere around maybe 3 billion people on planet Earth. Pollution goes away. Technology is up to a high point where everybody lives a comfortable life and you don't need people to work anymore. Interesting, isn't it? This is happening right now. It's going. It's happening. So the, the future isn't about pollution. It isn't about these sort of things. But it, it should be about high education, quality of life, and self-initiation. More people are now moving to the cities than ever before because that's what normally would happen in something like this. Younger people are moving to cities. They're not buying cars. The car companies know this. You aren't going to need as many cars as you needed before. The marketing people know this. They're studying this. They're trying to figure out how to get you to buy a car when you don't need one. And that's, we've kind of known about that for a while, haven't we? <laughs> but uh, what's interesting is, is how does this affect reincarnation? If there's almost 7 billion people here now reincarnating, what happens when there's only maybe 3 billion people actually in physical body? There's only one of us here. Remember, there's only one of us here. Everything evolves, and the light has told me the next phase of incarnation, which is beginning, is called enfoldment. Enfoldment, not expansion. How many of us have twin flames? How many of us have twins somewhere on the planet? How many of us get together in groups? We're going to be reincarnating more personalities, more knowledge into an individual than ever before in history because we needed the expansion so some of us would get through to this point. Like a tree creates many, many seeds to hope some of them will get through. But it is only one tree. There's only one tree here. It's us. You're not going away. You're going to continue to reincarnate. But now you're going to be wiser more multidimensional than ever before. So it's time to start thinking about your next lives, who you want to be with. And I mean, be with. <laughs> be with. It's called enfoldment. Um, incarnation, everything keeps evolving to fit what, the, what we in the universe are going through. So none of us are going away, just as the spirulina never went away, just as the microbes never went away. They incorporated into us, didn't they? They used to be individuals. Now there's billions of them in us, living still, as a higher life form. Fascinating, isn't it? So all this changes very interestingly. And there's something else to consider in a new light <laughs> as we move on. <laughs> that is, earth changes. There's only two things that can happen. It's going to get hotter, it's going to get colder. Uh -huh. Period. How are we going to deal with it? The truth is that we're, we're kind of really overdue with long historical records of an ice age right now. If we had an ice age right now, it would be disastrous. We'd have glaciers higher than the Empire State Building squeezing us into little Easter islands, and we know how that turned out. Um, so it, it, it's either going to get hot or going to get colder. The Earth is overdue for an ice age. The sun is getting old and cranky. It's getting hotter. They've been measuring it for accurately for at least 100 years. It's getting hotter and hotter. And everything has a life. Every star is born and dies and re relives somewhere else. Every planet has a life. The Earth will die no matter what we do. Now, we can keep our quality of life here, and the Earth knows this, by the way. That's why we were born. It's beyond intelligence. The great stuff is beyond intelligence. That's why we're here. The earth knows this already. You know you're going to die someday, right? So does the earth. So your children will live on, won't they? They will go to other countries, other places, and live on and carry your life with you. The earth knows this. So it's either going to get hotter or colder, no matter what we do. We should be good stewards. We should do everything we can. We should have electric cars right now. You know, self-initiation will bring them, nothing else. Free energy is just around the corner. In fact, it's already here. 
You know, there's nothing can hold this back. Nothing, no conspiracy, anything can hold this back. The truth is there is no such thing as free energy. There's almost free energy. <laughs> Check physics out. We, there are devices coming out now. You can buy some now. Certainly in three to five years, you'll be, buying, you'll be able to buy them for your home, somewhere around $5,000 or so, that will generate all the electricity you need for your home. The future is completely electric. And these devices will almost, cost almost nothing to operate. It changes everything, doesn't it? The rainforests are being cut down because most people, most of these poor people need to create charcoal to sell to live, cut wood to cook to eat. We in the West should be more generous than ever. We need to go there and give these people solar energy and hot plates so they won't cut down the rainforest because we need the rainforest. We need to be more generous than ever before. And we're very generous already, but where is the generosity focused? Why are these people burning the rainforest? It's a reason they're burning it. We can help them. And it would cost spare change, basically. Solar-powered LEDs going into the third world. Hot plates. You don't have to go hunting for wood anymore and denude anything. We should organize and start shipments of these things, give these things to these people. Now, we can do something. Now. So think about creating some groups that can do these sort of things. LED lighting runs on solar. All of this. And there, by the way, there are millions of people that have worked to develop this stuff so that you can then get this idea and start doing it. The technologies are available now and going to get even better. We need to address the rainforests of the world and why people are doing this sort of thing. I've always thought it was very odd that almost all the, the disposable chopsticks in the world come from the rainforest. Isn't that an interesting concept? Let's cut down the rainforest and turn them into disposable <laughs> chopsticks. Why not just carry, like I do, a permanent pair in my bag? Um, whenever I'm out with people and I ask them not to do that and I carry extras and try to hand it to them, most people put me down. Um, then when they're all finished, I collect all the chopsticks. I have lots of chopsticks at my home. I tell people I'm saving up to build my dream home. <laughs> but. I want to recycle them in some way. Sometimes I do art, and sometimes it, it helps when I'm doing uh, wood projects. I think of ways to use these chopsticks, because this is rainforest wood for the most part. Interesting, isn't it? We can stop that. Don't use disposable chopsticks. Think about it. What a concept, you know? Um, so as things are either going to get hotter or colder, and it looks like we're not going to have an ice age because the earth, the earth was almost triggered into one in the 1800s. It's called the mini ice age. Check it out. And it affected the planet. But we snapped out of it. Did you know, and forgive me for saying this, it seems heretical, but driving your car to this workshop, this seminar, and polluting the planet a little bit has held off the ice age. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're doing your job. We do, we do what Gaia does in human form. <laughs> Just like Snowball Earth was cured through pollution. I'm not saying we need any more of it, but I'm saying that from the first human fire to this moment, this extra heat is keeping off an ice age. And the polar caps have melted many, many times. I love the polar bears. I love these animals. But no matter what we do, we're in a period where the polar caps are going to melt again, and people shouldn't be building houses on the beach anymore. You know, um, What people think about is uh, short-term phases. There's been, like on the news, the worst storm in recorded history. I, I researched it up, and it was 1979 when they started recording. <laughs> think about it for a second. You know, at best, it's 1930s. You know? In recorded history, that's nothing to Gaia. When you look at the long-term cycles, of hundreds of thousands of years and millions of years, we're actually in a very calm time. The last 10,000 years have been a gift to humanity and higher consciousness, a gift to us. So in long-term periods, yes, we're, we're quite normal right now. In fact, a little better off than most periods. But because of media and everybody playing this up, you can't hold off the inevitable. Things have to change. You know, there used to be a number of species of humans. We're the only species of humans left. 
there was a gigantic event that happened maybe, uh, what, 200,000 years ago in which almost all humans were wiped out except for a small tribe. That's why we're all related, no matter what color you are. They've proven that genetically. We're all related to one tribe. Maybe they say 200 people survived, humans. All the other species died. And there's been other species of humans, just like other species of monkeys, you know. Um, so think about this. Things change. This is reality. Grow up. Deal with it, you know. Um, you got a lot of people manipulating us, making us feel guilty when this is really a bigger thing that's going on. And yes, we should do what we can do. And things are going to change no matter what we do. But we can, we can survive and we can, we're living in a great period in history. And here's one of the things we can do. Things, and there have been many books written on this. I don't know if you're aware of it. Life and Death of Planet Earth. People are thinking about this and dealing with it already. It's interesting. But the likelihood because of the sun and because we don't need another ice age, take your pick, you know, it's going to get warmer. We can deal with heat. We can't deal with an ice age. We couldn't deal with it. So the future is kind of, you know, I mean, talking thousands of years into the future, we deal with it. And then, there, and, you know, we deal with this in, in, in this next period that's coming up. But it's many thousands of years from now. It's not immediate. So don't go panic and build one of these things unless you want to. <laughs> but thanks to people like Buckminster Fuller and others, we already have the technology to deal with it. The technology is already here. We're thousands of years in advance of where we think we are. We're not behind at all. We're, we're thinking way ahead. Way, way ahead. And so... Guys, children are just amazing. We are traveling through the universe as conscious beings, coming into light, just about to be born again. When they say born again, it means a lot more to me now than it used to. <laughs> um, just amazing. And, and just, a, just an idea, look at this. Such an amazing multidimensional planet. When you think of the past, present, and future, that's division. And in reality, what you think is the past, what you think is the future, is just an illusion. Because no matter what, how you've ever lived, no matter where you're going, you will always only experience now. Period. What you think is the past is really part of the now. And history keeps changing all the time, does it, if you're a history scholar? What was history? What anybody wants to make of it? So they say if you could change the present, you change the future, but also we change the past all the time. And w winners have written the history books, and we change our own histories. We change our own stories of our lives. So this is a normal thing. History changes. The future changes. The present changes. It all changes. all dynamic in this one moment of now. As your consciousness expands, you begin to encompass what was the past and what is the future into the now. And these are, uh, these are examples here. Just as the spirulina never went away, the oldest, oldest life forms on Earth are still here. And in us... Imagine this. You can technically take a picture of Stone Age Aborigines, which are still living, still operating, and actually stand them next to an astronaut and take a picture. <laughs> Stunning, isn't it? Talk about the past and the present and the future and the now. It's right in front of you all the time. And what's interesting is, is that these dream and make myths of the moon. This guy's been there and played golf. <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? And you can stand them next to each other in the now, physically. What a paradigm shift to start thinking about. Now, we, we all remember these periods in our cellular memory. And the last time we were in these caves, the last time was 25,000 years ago when we started this last cycle that 2012 is all about. This is where we were the last time we made this circle. Where will we be able the next time? The next time we make this circle, where will we be? This circle from here to the present took 25,000 years. You blinked and you missed it, didn't you? We did it. Interesting, isn't it? You were there. We all were there. And we, where will we be the next time we make this circle? See how, and that will go so fast. Just as me talking to you right now about this, that went so fast, didn't it? Blinking of an eye, cosmic time, blinking of an eye, and look at where we are. Where will we be? Well, it's interesting. Guys, children have always been gazing at the heavens, stargazers, always. 
as long as we've known, we've looked at the stars. Why? Why are we so fascinated with the stars? Why did the Earth create us to be stargazers? Starting to get an inkling? We can't stay here forever. We are the birds that must leave the nest at some point and take all of life with us. We are, and our DNA and our technologies are Noah's Ark. There are many, many scientific projects out there finding planets and solar systems every day. And what we're looking for is planets like us in the Goldilocks range for the size of the planet to the star. Planets that have all forms of water, liquid, gas, and solid. Because that's where you're going to find people like, beings sort of like us. If we're going to go to other planets, that's where we have to go. The, check out NASA website. We're discovering these things by the dozens, weekly now. Incredible planetary systems. And we're looking for the Goldilocks range. And why? Well, maybe not even NASA knows. But a lot of people are already thinking about, someday we have to leave the planet. We're thousands of years ahead of this already. <coughs> and whether you know it or not, your taxpayer money and you were a part of this directly. You're supporting this, this effort. Don't let them stop this kind of stuff. We're discovering new worlds every day. And just as a metaphor, the Bible for an example, there are many heavens for us to go to, many mansions, many heavens and many mansions for us. There's no shortage of even worlds for us. And by the time we get there, though, we won't know what, there would be no kind of pollution as we transcend to that level to be able to go there. We won't be polluters. We will be evolved. We will be there physically. Our DNA will incorporate. We are the kings of metamorphosis. Many worlds, many mansions. Gosh, it's inspiring, isn't it? where we're going. We are traveling through the universe. Our planet, our solar system, our galaxy is moving at a rapid rate throughout the cosmos. We are certainly star beings. We are the star seed. Why have we always been gazing at the stars? Our mother knew why. Our mother pointed us at the stars. And now I'd like to share a poem with you. It is the first poem I wrote after my near-death experience. It is entitled, Let Love Rise. And it goes like this. We who are here now are the creations of the first word. We who are here now are the rays of the first light. We who are here now are the seeds of the first garden. And now, for one moment in eternity, let us open our hearts and let love rise. Let love rise and fill us with gratitude. Look again, for deep in every human soul there is a knowing that all life is a gift beyond measure and that love, yes, love, love, love,